listening to Awake in Relationship, a podcast about intimacy, community, and culture in a time of great change, with Silas Rose. Rose, thank you so much for tuning into Awake in Relationship. In a time when many of us are spending more than 11 hours a day glued to a screen, our innate connection with nature has clearly been interrupted. Youth in particular are vulnerable to algorithms that distort our sense of self and how we perceive the world around us. Beyond COVID-19, there's a looming mental health crisis on the horizon, and there isn't an app for that. In this episode of Awake in Relationship, I speak with David Siegel, clinical counselor and co-author with Dr. Nevin J. Harper and Catherine Rose of Nature-Based Therapy, a practitioner's guide to working with children, youth, and families. I personally found this conversation super timely, as here in the Pacific Northwest, we've been completely inundated with wildfire smoke for the last three weeks uh, from the fires in Washington. David shares some wisdom around nature-based practices for dealing with some of the grief and anxiety some of us might be feeling right now around the state of our world, the climate crisis, and also being stuck in the middle of a global pandemic without a clear end. So I hope this episode inspires you to take a break from your device, maybe head out for a walk and uh, reconnect to the natural beauty around us and the sanity of Earth. Well, David, uh, welcome to Awaken Relationship. Thank you, Silas. It's it's an honor and pleasure to be here. I happen to know that uh, you recently just turned 40, so a uh, belated happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, it feels feels like a an important turning point for me in terms of stepping into my nurturing generative adulthood and how I can really think about what does it mean to be of service and an adult in this world. Yeah, I know it was a huge uh, transition time for me, a time of great reflection, and also just kind of gratitude for the journey. Actually, that's kind of where I want to start our conversation. You know, both you and I uh, are of a certain vintage, as it were, when we remember life uh, pre-internet. I know in my kind of um, teens, in particular, I, I, I was born in Toronto, moved to Qualcomm Beach. I spent most of my, my days outdoors, and uh, I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about you know, some of your early experiences with um, being in nature and uh, how that's kind of led to your current work. Yeah, great question. Makes me think of that quote about what does David Suzuki, Vandana Shiva, Henry David Thoreau have in common, and it's that they all had positive early childhood experiences in nature, which le- then led them to fall in love with the more than human natural world and, and ultimately want to protect it. And I feel very fortunate that I, I too had had a very strong connection as a child of, of ra- ranging in my neighborhood, in the local ravine by the Don River stream in Toronto and having the ability to, to really uh, have some unstructured play where the neighborhood creatures, the, the owls and the hawks and the, rodents and all the creatures that live in the forest became part of my world as well. So I was very fortunate to have that as a kid. And that led into a great love of canoeing and exploring the lakes of the Canadian Shield, and then ultimately wanting to to offer that to other people. So turning into a a canoe guide and taking a long story and making it quite short, realizing that I, I wanted to offer that to people who faced barriers to access nature. Didn't want to just be a guide uh, where we're looking at nature and bring kind of quite privileged people. So that led me into the nonprofit sector and looking at, I worked for an organization called Boundless Adventures, which has been around for about 25 years. They take people on the Madawaska River and they have an outdoor school. So that's where I spent quite a few years before moving to the West Coast. So much of your, your private practice in nature based therapy focuses with on. Uh youth and young adults. What do you think some of the challenges our young people are facing today that maybe we didn't have growing up? That's such a great question. I believe one of the the challenges is that we are really living in a risk-averse society. 
we're very phobic of, of risk. You see that with kind of this term called helicopter parents and the media uh, talking about things like world's worst mom when a, a nine-year-old was given the opportunity to take the subway in New York on his own without any kind of inquiry into what had that parent done to prepare that youth for that challenge. I'd say one of the, one of the first challenges is that children are, are quite bubble wrapped, that the idea of risk and risky play, which I distinguish between hazard. A hazard is something that is just dangerous. There's no be- benefit that can come from it. Whereas risk involves some element of danger, but also some great benefit in navigating that risk. And if a parent can support the youth, I think a term that, that I liked was a hummingbird parent. So being prepared, being around, watching scaffolding, and then coming in when, when the child needs, needs them. But that opportunity to, to have adventure and risk, I believe, really creates resilience. And I believe another challenge is the way that the internet, social media, gaming has really infiltrated uh, young people's lives. They connect through TikTok and through these uh, text and other online mediums, which I believe really limits their ability to learn how to have genuine social connections, face-to-face encounters, learn how to read body language, how to attune with each other, and to have rich social environments with different generations mentoring and, and supporting their emotional and social growth. So unfortunately, what we find is a lot of young people who, who are really scared of social interactions beyond the, the computer, <laughs> a lot of anxiety, this, the term awkward has come up so often. I feel awkward, Dave, when I'm out with my friends. I feel awkward. And I was asking someone the other day, what, what do you mean by awkward? What is awkward? It's just this fear of doing something wrong, screwing it up. So it's not just me. <laughs> yeah, it's something that's getting really pervasive in our, in our society, this, this idea that we have to, you know, on a, a text message, you can think about it. On an email, you can think about it and you can craft this, eloquent or a message that that's kind of quote perfect but in in the social world when when it's not connected to screens we're filled with mistakes and we blunder and we and we just show show up as ourselves and and I, I believe it's those experiences of showing up as ourselves and being accepted by our peers and seeing that they also blunder around that creates a sense of safety and a sense of confidence that we are okay being who we are. So, so that's something I'm noticing with the young people. Yeah, the role of technology is, is really key in my mind, and particularly being kind of siloed and, and cut off from, from others and from the natural world. This is kind of a lead into the question around what, what is nature-based therapy and, and how does it bridge that, uh, that divide? In the book, we spend quite a bit of time trying to articulate what nature-based therapy is because we were cautious about having a rigid definition that we recognize this is not new by any stretch. Nature-based therapy is nothing new. However, it it is new in conventional psychology, draws on ancient wisdom. All all land-based cultures knew knew the value of a deep, respectful, reciprocal relationship with with the natural world and, and how sustainable and just society requires that level of deep connection. So this is not new. It's really us looking at the problem of isolation and and disconnection. So our belief is that nature-based therapy is about reconnection, coming home. The the field draws on the work of eco-psychologists. So eco being oikos, home, psyche, Mm. the breath, that spirit in us and logos, the study of, so the study of our psyche in our earthly home. So who are we as human beings when we truly recognize that we're a part of this larger living world and how does supporting that reconnection offer people a part of themselves that they, they don't have access to when they're disconnected? Uh, David, what does it mean to kind of do nature-based work on unceded territories. In Victoria, we live in the uh, Kwangan speaking territory. It's such an important question. And it's something that I, I'm really grappling with uh, daily. 
this idea that nature-based therapy, again, is just so not new. It's, uh, and it could be even seen as, as offensive to, to suggest that it's a new approach to, to anyone who, who's part of a culture that recognizes the value and, and, and has cultivated practices of, of deep respect and reciprocity with nature. So I guess the first thing is, is just to really recognize the tensions and, and the political reality of, of that. It's not an innocent, it's not a benign approach that, that there's privilege involved. How, how do we have access to these spaces? And what is the history uh, that has allowed that to, to take place? And uh, we ac- I actually co-authored a paper with Alicia Jones looking at unsettling eco-psychology, trying to address some of these questions and and there we didn't really arrive at any clear cut answers but but the most important piece we took away was of the importance of asking these questions because it's true that human nature counseling the organization i'm a part of we have the great privilege and honor to be working on the unceded territories of the lekwungen people and to the north of sanic people and so what is our responsibility how do we do this work in a good way? How do we form relationships with the local nations? How do we uh, take steps to, to look at our settler privilege and the, the gaps in our awareness uh, that may per- be perpetuating harm? And I, I've found that by asking those questions, by trying to have and build genuine relationships with the nations, uh, that a lot, a lot of surprising and good things have come from that. And one example is a program that we're doing with the Esquimalt and the Songhees Nation called Guam Guam Speckums, and it translates to strong flowers. And it's just been such a nurturing relationship to, to partner with these nations, to bring in some of the work that we have and, and see how it can just support uh, the work that the community is already doing. And to see these youth, uh, you know, blooming um, like like big strong flowers um, has been really special. So I, I'm really appreciating that you asked that question, and it's something that I think the field, anyone doing outdoor based work, anyone involved in um, outdoor recreation or or naturalism or you know nature based work, really, especially if you have a settler identity, which means you you were not born um, or sorry, your ancestry is not from these lands that it's just so important to be asking these questions. So thanks so much, Silas, for bringing that up. So speaking practically, what, what would a session look like? And, you know, how, how, is, how does this differ from more traditional forms of talk therapy? So a nature-based therapy approach, it's the way that we described it is not, it's not a model where we've got these prescribed interventions. It's more of a framework. So it's experiential. And what that means is we, we don't just talk about going in and connecting with nature in the office we, or, and brainstorm different ways people can do that. We actually go do that with people. So let's go outside. Let's drop into our senses, drop into our bodies. It's experiential, meaning that it's the experience itself that's going to allow for the change rather than some insight or some talking about an experience. Uh, it's systemic in that we're really looking at systems ecological systems, family systems, and how everyone's connected and hitched to each other. And so we try to work with families. If we're working with an individual, we look at how the system is operating and getting stuck in negative patterns. And we try to offer opportunities to to look at positive patterns. So a good example would be a family that I was just working with where they were really stuck in this rigid pattern of fighting and really reactive and we got outside and we got them into their bodies through play and i could just see the their all their uh, facial expressions were changing Um, the kids were smiling the parents were were laughing and the closeness you could feel it it was palpable so so that experiential systemic approach and then there's this ecological or sorry uh, eco-psychological approach of recognizing that that our psyche is more than just the skin encapsulated body that we inhabit. It's our psyche is connected to 
the trees, the rivers, the air. I mean, just, you know, that smoke we just had here. So when our air is, is filled with the smoke from our burning earth, we feel it not just in our lungs, but in our, in our hearts. And so that's, uh, every session is going to look different. It's going to depend on the people that we have, their connection with nature, the location that we're choosing, what are their goals, but that element of it, it being experiential, it being systemic, us really privileging this idea of embodiment and uh, dropping into the senses. I was going to ask about that actually, because, uh, I know one of the modalities that you emphasize is somatic experiencing. So somatic experiencing is the work of Peter Levine, and we are actually drawing on the larger body of work, which might be called uh, interpersonal neurobiology or somatic psychology. So somatic experiencing is one model that's been developed. But essentially it's this idea that, as van der Kolk says, the body keeps the score. Adverse experiences in life are held in our bodies and they show up in our perception of the world, in, in the sensations we feel in our bodies, and they can really limit us. They can really create you know, patterns, rigid patterns of survival that then become our, our prisons. And so a, a somatic approach really recognizes that the body and tuning in to the sensations mm-hmm. of the body to the wisdom of the body is the way to transform the locked sense of these adverse experiences. I was just thinking though about this idea of partnering with the body, the wisdom of the body. And you asked me, what is, what is the core of nature-based therapy? And, and I believe it's partnering with the natural world. So it's this Mm -hmm. idea of a three-way relationship. We have the therapist, you have the client, and then you also have mother earth, the, the more than human natural world there to to support. I'm sure you and I and most of the people listening know that more time in nature is good for us. Um, but what does the science say? There's actually been an amazing surge of research coming out from the fields of environmental psychology, conservation psychology, and other related disciplines. And essentially, they are very much confirming what we know intuitively, that psychologically, socially, emotionally, spiritually, being connected with the natural world, spending time in nature, even viewing nature has benefits in all those areas. And there's just an amazing body of growing research showing that. So, you know, everything from people in, in hospitals undergoing surgery, recovering faster when they have views of nature from their, from their room to looking at like the proximity of parks uh, to where people live in, in urban environments and seeing that, Resiliency and mood is increasing. Uh, people who, who are diabetic having uh, less of a need for insulin and, and be- better regulation of their blood sugar levels. And these, these impacts actually last uh, significantly long. There's some great research coming out of Japan and Korea with this practice called Shinrin Yoku. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Forest, forest pain. Yeah, it translates to something like breathing in the forest with all five senses. And there's some amazing research there looking at cancer fighting cells, immune responses. And they're looking at all the chemicals in the forest that are uh, just so we're so made for them uh, in terms of our health and well-being that I guess the research to really uh, boil it down is saying that human beings are designed to be in natural environments. And just like a caged lion shows more aggression, trouble, trouble mating, trouble with its health, mental and physical. Human beings as well show those same markers of of ill health when we are disconnected from natural spaces. It really points to our our interconnectedness. And and I guess the inverse is is true as well. You spoke earlier about the uh, wildfire smoke that uh, we've just kind of gone through. and We're completely socked in uh, on the coast here from the fires in uh, Washington or Oregon. I know myself... I was feeling a lot of sadness and uh, despair during that time. And uh, how do you think we can begin to kind of process this immense amount of grief that we're feeling for the state of our planet and uh, in future? It's such an important question, Silas. I just think about that if in our work of reconnecting, that a part of reconnecting comes 
with the realization that this beautiful world that we're a part of is, is burning and is in a climate crisis and is experiencing species you know, extinction at levels that are just so unprecedented. And so that grief, that sadness, that despair that comes, that pain, psychological and spiritual pain that comes when something we love is being hurt, and destroyed is so big and so real. And I believe that most of us, when we're not supported in that, it just becomes overwhelming and we, and we can't handle it. And so I, I guess I look to some of my teachers, one being jo- jo- Joanna Macy, who has mm-hmm. done some beautiful work around how to, how to support people in transforming that grief and pain into, into active hope is the term she uses in her latest book, Active Hope. And there's also been quite a few eco-psychologists like Thomas Doherty and out of Portland is really trying to look at this idea of eco-anxiety and eco-grief that, that it makes sense that we're feeling this terror, that we're feeling this uh, oscillation between hopelessness and numbness and at times perhaps a, a feeling of maybe we can get through this. But just to really recognize that, A, that all makes sense. That is our Earth's nervous system responding and saying this is not okay the same way that when we touch a burning stove and pull our hand back that when we see the devastation and we have a big response that that is so important and then the the next idea is okay how do we come together that human beings are bonding social mammals and that we do our best when we're in community we're wired for that sue johnson one of the uh, a big proponent of emotion focused and attachment based therapy says we're homo vinculum the the bonding social mammal that we need each other and that that's our our number one protective defense when we're in times of distress is to come together and to see that we're not alone because to suffer is inevitable but to suffer alone is intolerable and so the magnitude that we're up against in terms of our climate crisis and just the political unrest in our world is so big. And I'm just such a big proponent of forming communities of, of practice where we can create rituals to, to help us process this grief so that we can then stand up and stare at the pain and not be afraid because in looking at it, it's gonna move us to wanna make the changes we need to make. One of, one of the greatest challenges that we're going through right now is not only this this overwhelm around the state of our planet, climate fires, et cetera, but we are we are kind of cut off from each other because of COVID, where many of us are forced to kind of work from home, stay at home. And uh, it, it's almost um, understandable that we would be kind of addicted to our screens and phones at this time and just want to numb out. What sort of, what would you suggest as a first step, given our situation, to kind of get off the screens and begin to kind of reestablish that connection with the living world. I believe that human beings are amazing adapters, that it might even be one of the marking features of our species that we can adapt. However, when change comes too fast, too quick, <clears throat> that's when we start to feel that overwhelm. And that's very much, I think, the case with COVID and what a profound shift we had to this narrative of, fit, of social distancing, which I, I take great, uh, I, I really have trouble with that word because as you just said, our, our emotional needs for connection are just so, are so big, especially in times of adversity. So, so I like the term physical distancing with strong social connections. But in terms of, of what's happening to us that when we're consuming these negative stories and we're you know, surfing the media and looking at the COVID numbers or looking at all the devastation in the world, our brain is just not designed to have that influx of negative messaging. It, it, it responds as if we're being threatened in that moment by a, you know, a predator. And we're really, we're, we're best able to deal with stress when we have moments of relaxation and moments of, of re- restoration. 
And so I, I really like to remind myself and the people I, I support that, that we, are, we, we just can't sustain ongoing stress responses. We just can't think clearly. We can't make great, good choices. We, we start to shut down. And so we have to help ourselves. We have to make choices and put in practices and routines that, that help us take a break from the, the stimuli, the, the adverse stimuli. And so coming up with some sort of practice, daily practice, where you take a break from the stressors and you know, stepping into the natural world is just one of the best ways to get, you get into your senses, you take a breath, you breathe in, you notice the sounds, notice the smells, see if you can start to feel the earth touching you, know, you whether it's your feet on the ground or the warmth of the sun on your skin or the rain. And that dropping into our senses bring, pulls us into the present moment, helps us, as Fritz Perl says, the, one of the founders of the Gestalt movement, lose your mind and find your senses. And in doing so, it just, it just is like, it's like a massage. It's giving you a chance to drop into that parasympathetic ner- branch of your nervous system. Because again, that, that constant uncertainty, the constant change, the stimuli that's coming at you, will just keep you in that state of hyper arousal. And then the choices when you're in that state is to either numb out, as you said, and collapse, or to move towards you know, profound anxiety and panic. So you've been doing this work for, I guess, over 10 years. And you published a book, a great book called Nature Based Therapy. And now you're making this kind of bold step towards uh, creating a nonprofit. Tell us a little bit about the mission of that nonprofit and, and where you see things going in the future. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, Human Nature Counseling is the organization that myself, Katie Rose, and Joey Worthington created about 10 years ago. And at that time, the mission was to, to provide an a option for children, youth, adults, and families to have a therapeutic experience outside of the office, outside of the traditional knee-to-knee face-to-face talk therapy and that organization's grown over that time and we've developed programs for youth programs for families and we've created some great partnerships with community organizations like power to be adventure therapy society and mary's mary's farm and sanctuary among others and it just kept nagging at us Uh, joey ended up moving up to to nova scotia and he started a, a similar program out there but it kept nagging at us that, that there's this barrier for people to access our services, and that's financial. And it didn't feel right <clears throat> to have a huge part of our, our society, our, our city, that can't access our services, just always weighted at our, our hearts. And so we decided that we needed to shift that. And the way to do that, we thought, was to, to establish a nonprofit charitable society And the mission really is to provide accessible nature-based therapy services to people across the lifespan. So we don't want to limit ourselves just to a certain age group, but really to offer these services to to whomever would find benefit in in accessing our our offerings. And it's really exciting. We've got uh, a lot of support and we just launched in September we're moving towards charitable status. We've got a great board of directors. I think it's really the opportune time on so many levels for this type of service to be to be offered to the greater Victoria area and hopefully potentially beyond. Uh, thinking about Dr. Bonnie Henry and her, her suggestions to get outside, uh, that when people are locked out in quarantine, when people are on their screens a lot, uh, getting outside, as, as we said earlier, has so many benefits. But also in this era of COVID, meeting outside, our need for physical social connection, we can, we can maintain the, the guidelines, we can keep the distance, and we can still have these therapeutic experiences that, that aren't just looking at Zoom. <laughs> it's actually interesting how, how the sessions on Zoom were more effective than I thought they were going to be. Mm, also, I think that at first I thought to myself, how am I ever going to connect with people on, on the screen? 
But again, we're such bonding creatures that when we can see a person's face, when we can tune into their voice, when we can hold presence, it's, it's a tonic for our nervous system. Uh, I mean, it, the, the challenge of Zoom as a nature-based therapist is obvious, I think. However, um, however, our relationship with the natural world is always with us. So we would have to adapt and do things like tell, ask people to tell us stories of times they were in nature or to visualize special places or to take time to look out their window or to connect with a, a pet or to tend tend to plants in their homes or, or I actually got into sprouting during the, during the pandemic where I was experimenting with alpha, alpha sprouts and all these other sprouts and having so much fun watching and tending uh, these little sprouts and then eating them mm. and doing the cycle over and over <laughs> again. So yeah, I guess it's a false dichotomy to think that, you know, the out, outside of the home is nature and that inside is not nature and that humans are not nature. That's, that's all this false dichotomy that we're trying to, to unearth. However, going into wild spaces is one of the most profound ways to kind of jumpstart the relationship if, if people are struggling with, with their sense of, of connection to the more than human natural world. So, so the internet's not all evil. It has some utility. <laughs> It's a great metaphor for this mycelium web you know, that the mushrooms uh, sprout from this vast web, this network. Um, I think that that's kind of the new, the new n- map or narrative that's, that's really coming into fruition, that we're so connected and that there's just such value in recognizing our connection. Well, David, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you or get the book, uh, what do you suggest? We we got our book published by New Society Publishers, which is a small publishing house on, I believe it's Gabriola Island, is where to find the book Nature-Based Therapy, a Practitioner's Guide to Working Outdoors with Children, Youth, and Families. We also have a website, www.humannaturecounseling.ca. And uh, we'd love to hear from anyone who's interested to learn more about our services, if they want to support our our nonprofit in any way. Uh, It's all about community. It's all about connection. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you, Sass. It was a lot of fun. Thanks again to David for this awesome conversation. I can really feel the wisdom and warmth in his words and also the deep passion for helping others and uh, the natural world. So hope to get him back soon sometime. If you want to learn more about David or nature-based therapy, head over to humannaturecounseling.ca. I will also post uh, some links and resources in the show notes at awakenedrelationship.com. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. And if you have any feedback for future episodes, you can send me a message through the contact page or on uh, Instagram and Twitter. So thank you, dear listener, for tuning in. And uh, till next time, Stay well and stay connected. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Awake in Relationship. If you liked what you heard, please click subscribe to get the latest show delivered fresh to your device or sign up for our newsletter at awakeinrelationship.com. Sharing is caring. 